Welcome to worship at the Laverne Church of the Brethren. I am Susan Boyer, senior pastor of this congregation, and delighted to be able to join you in this space. We are eager to connect with you in meaningful ways. We send out a monthly email about upcoming events we are holding virtually and in person. You can subscribe to that email right off our homepage at lavernecob.org. I'd love to meet you via Zoom at one of our virtual opportunities. We are also grateful for your ongoing financial contributions to help keep this church's ministry thriving. You can donate to this church off the homepage as well. Next week, this congregation will be celebrating Dia de los Muertos. If you live within driving distance, we would love to have you join us at 9.30 a.m. for worship and then an intergenerational celebration on our courtyard at 10.40 a.m. As we move into this worship today, I invite you to take a moment to remember the saints in your lives, the loved ones who now form your great cloud of witnesses, those people who by their example taught you about goodness, kindness, bravery, faithfulness. Let us move into this space of worship with gratitude in our hearts for the love and witness of our saints. As we come together to worship, we remember our great cloud of witnesses. Their stories have been written deep in our hearts. We are flooded with memories of them at their best. Their legacies spur us on to be our best selves. For neither death nor life can separate them or us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. We are connected still. Wisdom 3, verses 1 to 3. The souls of the righteous are in the hand of God, and no torment will ever touch them. In the eyes of the foolish, they seem to have died, and their departure was thought to be a disaster, and their going from us to be their destruction, but they are at peace.
I am in my 37th year of ordained ministry, and in that time period, I, I th I'm guessing that I have officiated at over 400 different memorial services. And I think that probably 90% of those were for people I, I knew well. I played cards with them or visited them in their homes or knew what kind of food they brought to potlucks or dedicated their children or prayed with them about their deepest wounds or all of the above. Occasionally, someone will ask me how I do this grief work and I consider it an absolute sacred privilege to walk with families during times of profound grief. And at the same time, I'm also navigating my own grief over the loss of that person. Much of my sorrow is for the loved ones of the deceased who, who now have to figure out life without their beloved. When I officiate at a memorial service here in the sanctuary, I can see the faces of the family sitting across the front pew. I see the absolute grief that's etched on their faces. I understand the toll that sorrow takes on the body, and I know that grief firsthand. What we most often do with things that cause that kind of agony is to just not talk about them. 
half of people over 40 whose parents are still living report that they don't talk to their elderly parents about the D word. In fact, a third of that same age group say that they would rather talk about their weight than broach the subject of death. That's, that's saying something. <laughs> However, if you ask their parents how comfortable they feel about talking about death, they often say it's one of the easiest subjects to discuss. Maybe one of the reasons for that is that the older you are, the more loss you've experienced and the more aware you are that we all die. You want and need a place to process your own feelings and anxieties about it, but those around you don't want to entertain the idea of you not being here. I have a framed photo in my house taken on the day I was ordained, which happened here in this sanctuary at the Laverne Church of the Brethren in June of 1985. I am standing in that photo in the very middle of the frame. My husband, my parents, and my mother-in-law are standing around me. Jackie Gingrich took that photo and she gave it to me when I moved back here to become the senior pastor. I keep that photo on the desk where I sit every morning to dry my hair. I'm the only person in that photo still alive. And that truth overwhelms me. Some days with profound loss, and some days with worry about how I will die, and some days with absolute gratitude for those four individuals who loved me and saw me. I carry photos of those same people around in my phone. A photo of me sitting on my mother's lap in our backyard in Kansas when I was six years old. Or the one of my wedding day with the exact same people standing around me. Brian in a champagne colored tux with tails. <laughs> a mistake of the tuck shop that almost derailed our wedding. There's a photo of my father in a swimming pool with a very young Matt, my oldest son, riding around on his back. I'm grateful, grateful for these photos that let me hold on and remember my family. That's what the author of Hebrews is doing in the 11th chapter. He or she is providing us with snapshots, verbal photos of our family of faith. Sarah, barren, into her old age, becomes pregnant. Rahab, who hid the Israelite scouts. Samson and Daniel, who both took on lions and won. We see Esther, considered weak and unimportant, who turns that weakness into strength. Hebrews talks about these giants of our faith and also mentions all the unnamed martyrs who were sawed in two, tormented, left destitute, or persecuted, and not even given a name. The author of Hebrews wants us to hold on to these photos of our religious ancestors. Remembering them is an invitation to see ourselves as part of this ongoing story. Starting with Abel, we journey through the Hebrew Bible with the author of Hebrews with the hope that it'll bring us right into the present, present stories of the faithful that we know. The book of Hebrews wants us to see our calling as part of this long line of the faithful. With a closer look, we see that some of these portraits tell stories of those who triumphed, strong individuals who received God's promises, shut the mouths of lions, conquered their enemies. And alongside the portraits of those who prevailed are those who just suffered greatly. Strong individuals who endured imprisonment, illness, violence, the family photo album of spiritual ancestors puts these portraits side by side. When we die, how we die, 
does not define our faithfulness or God's love for us. In a culture that puts people into categories of successes and failures, the book of Hebrews intermingles triumph and suffering. Faithfulness can shine through both as well as in joy and sorrow and life and death. I just got back from a vacation to Savannah, Georgia with my youngest son. And of course we went to Bonaventure Cemetery, which must be one of the most beautiful cemeteries in our country. We lazily strolled through this beautiful place reading the old worn gravestones of those who died in infancy and those who lived to be 104. I often go to cemeteries when I travel. I believe they tell us so much history, so much about its place and its culture. A graveyard was often a stop on my family vacations of my childhood. One of my, one of the memories my children have of my mother, their grandmother, is of her taking them to a cemetery. She came equipped with butcher paper and charcoal and she had them make rubbings of their favorite gravestones. I experienced that very same activity with my mother when I was a child. Now I'm guessing there's some of you who think this practice of visiting cemeteries and making rubbings is bit macabre or maybe disrespectful. I couldn't disagree more. My parents intentionally wanted their children to make friends with death rather than see it as the enemy or the worst thing that can happen or something to fight against with whatever means necessary. They wanted us to see death as part of life. I think that's another intention of the author of Hebrews. As we move from chapter 11 to chapter 12, we hear these words, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us. We don't need to fear death or refuse to discuss it or pretend it won't happen to us or fight it with every fiber of our beings for we are surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses, surrounded in love. They may not be here on earth anymore but their love for us and our love for them never dies. When I leave this world, I want my family to know without reservation that I'm fine and they're okay. I want those who come after me to run with perseverance and joy and faithfulness the race that is theirs, the race that's set before them. Next week we are doing something here at the Laverne Church of the Brethren that we have never done before. We are celebrating Dia de los Muertos. Translated into English, you heard it means the Day of the Dead. Dia de los Muertos is in essence a celebration of love, family, and life. It's not a solemn event. This multi-day event allows people the time to remember and connect with those who have died. People build home altars, ofrendas, and they put offerings on them, marigolds, favorite foods of the departed, photos of family members they want to remember. Remembering them is our privilege and our obligation. Families make trips to the cemetery together. They share picnics and next to the graveside of their ancestors. Humorous stories are told, lively music abounds. By not being afraid to speak of death, by honoring and remembering the lives of those who have passed on, Dia de los Muertos reminds us to be more deeply aware of the precious moments of this life that we have. The feel of the breeze on our face, the authentic conversation with a friend, laughing with family over shared memories, all those moments you wouldn't think 
to take a photo of, but that fill you with an absolute sense of the giftedness and the preciousness of this life that you have been given. Dia de los Muertos isn't just about connecting with the dead or reminding us of the gift of this life, but it also connects us with the living. People give each other sugar skulls, pan de muerto, bread of the dead, Mexican bread that's shaped very specifically with what looks like a large drop in the center and bones that go out from it. Some say that circle in the middle is a, is a teardrop shed for those who have died. This holiday is a very healthy way to honor the dead and our grief over their death while celebrating love and family and life. Next week, we're gonna celebrate Dia de los Muertos at the Laverne Church of the Brethren. There will be those of us in this congregation who have never experienced this holiday and those for whom this multi-day event is a day of deep family tradition and significance. We will be led in worship by a member of our congregation for whom Dia de los Muertos is a, has deep significance. And as I said, we will build an ofrenda. So bring with you next week that framed photo or favorite food or memento, something that reminds you of a loved one who is now part of your great cloud of witnesses. After worship, we're gonna go out into the courtyard to the sounds of a live mariachi band, traditional bread and Mexican hot chocolate, and the opportunity to make papa picado or flower marigolds or color masks. Friends, listen to the lives of those who now encircle you from the other side of the grave. I hear them telling us to to connect with each other, to remember them and all the precious moments that we shared together, to live every moment of this precious life that we have been given, and to not be afraid. We are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Let us remember the gift of faith and faithfulness they have bestowed on us as we run the race that is set before each of us. Amen. Will the circle be unbroken by and by, Lord, by and by? There's a better home awaiting in the sky, Lord, in the sky. Once again, Will the circle be unbroken by and by, Lord, by and by? There's a better hope awaiting in the sky, Lord, in the sky. What a cloud of saints around us, what a path that they have shown. How they cheer and we're just onward as we come into our own. Will the circle be unbroken by and by, Lord, by and by? There's a better home awaiting in the sky, Lord, in the sky. We are standing on their shoulders. Strength and stay. Make the 
time. In the circle, be unbroken. By and by, and by Lord, by and by. There's a better home awaiting in the sky, Lord, in the sky. In the sky, Lord, in the sky. Friends, the circle is not broken. A cloud of saints surrounds all of us. Do not be afraid. And may it be well, so very, very well with your soul. Amen. <laughs>